Welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, with your host, Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields and academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Anthony Gonzalez joins us today to talk about his love of music, performing, and being a representative for some of the most talented artists today. Hello and welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, brought to you by Great Success Education. I am your host, Mark Hoberman. Our co-host today is Susan Brender. Hey, Susan, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you for having me as your host. As always. Uh, you know, we've had so many guests on in the field of music. We've had musicians, singers, Broadway stars. Today we have someone who's not only a musician, but, you know, also represents some of these musicians and other people in the entertainment industry. So uh, I think he hails from your area and, and somewhere in Florida as well. So, yes. uh, you know, he's going to give us the, kind of the backstory to how hard it is to actually represent people, all the work that's necessary. People think, hey, bam, you show up. Oh, the concert's on. So we want to educate people as to the different things that are needed to mm -hmm. actually put on a performance and get people gigs. So well, let's bring them on now. Today, our guest is musician and founder of ALG Entertainment, Anthony Gonzalez. Anthony, welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame. Yes, thank you, Mark. Thank you. And thank you, Susan, as well. Uh, pleasure to be here to join you. Great, great to have you. Anthony, how did you first become interested in music as a career? Because besides a musician, you're so steeped in music in many ways. But I'm sure that didn't happen over overnight. So how did that come about? No, it, it, it happened actually interesting. Uh, my background in music as a musician actually helped me accelerate within my, my career in the music industry. Uh, I always say that I started when I was 16 because that's when I started playing my first professional gig as a trumpet player. And I picked up the trumpet when I was 12 years old in middle school. And I was fortunate to have great band directors who not just were our teachers in school, and, I, and they served as mentors as well, but they also played out there professionally with a lot of big names back in the day when the whole big band scene was very popular. And, and so they came back to school with great stories and, and not only how to, they instructed us how to play our instruments, but how to also behave or conduct ourselves as professional musicians once we went out there and, and, and certain demeanor and behavior that you had to follow if you wanted to, to follow that uh, career. Uh, and, and that's where I, I, I want to say that's where it began for me. You know, Anthony, what I what I want to know is that when you really become a musician, you need an awful lot of patience and a lot of persistence because it's not an easy thing to do. And even in, during this particular time, and I spoke to Tito Puente about this, and he said to me, it's been a rough year a really rough year. So how did you get through it? And were you able to play any gigs anywhere around? You know, it, it's, a, it, it, it's, I think that the, the music career overall, whether, uh, and I was thinking about this earlier, the, the public usually sees the, the, the artist, right? Their career, how they sure. do and all oh, and famous and all this, but there's a, you know, there's a lot of sacrificing along the way, whether they don't spend enough time with their families or on the road to doing this. But the people behind the scenes as well are also on top of that every day. So it's, it's really the entertainment industry is a very sacrificing career. Um, it, you know, it, you, you mentioned how, how do we adjust? It's almost like when I first started playing the horn and, in, and it's a brass instrument and the first week, two weeks, even the first month, what comes out of the end of the horn there, the bell, is not pretty. But you, 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 but you think that you, you know, you can't because you, you feel something is getting better and your neighbors are telling you to shut up, close the windows because the kids are mocking you down the street. And eventually you start making some nice music. And this is kind of like what COVID has been. We, we've been locked up. There's, there's been, at the beginning, we thought there was nothing we could do. Then we started to have to get creative. The virtual thing, concerts, the streaming, Everyone kind of jumped on that. And it worked to keep engagement up. It certainly did that and it kept activity going from a monetary or financial side. Clearly it, it never replaces what an artist 
uh, their compensation and their lifestyle and everything that follows through that. But at least they kept the engagement, that everything going. The, the, the idea was to not have them stop. The artists that I work with, for example, I, I, just, I knew that I had to keep on, as a coach, get a, get a goal. There's, are, if there are no games, we, we, we keep training. We keep maintaining ourselves healthy. And how do we do that? Well, through their social media, let's update it, let's update your bio, let's update your website. There's so many other things that we, we did do. Yes, the economy clearly slowed down for the bulk of them because the majority of artists nowadays make their living from live performance, not when it, it isn't like it was when we sold more CDs or we sold albums. The yeah. streaming business is not uh, as lucrative as the... the, uh, the went back when it was CDs or, or vinyl or cassettes or even eight tracks. Yeah. You know, I have a question for you, Mark. And one of the questions that I have is dealing, when you were a teacher, you must have had a band that played in your school and it's a community. There's something about the fact that people who play, um, who are musicians and play all kinds of instruments, they love to get together and they become like a really good community. Did you see that happen at your school, Mark? I didn't just see it. I lived it. I was in the band since probably third or fourth grade. Started with the clarinet. Uh, and actually, uh, I wanted to use play the trumpet, uh, but uh, somehow the clarinet was left and I, and I picked that up and loved it. But Talk about community. Our school was so dedicated to the band. The administration was so great that we had a band class, which means that 30 freshmen who were in the band would be in a first period class together. When it was time to go to math, other kids went to different rooms. Our band class went to the same math room. We traveled as a band family. We had a great band leader named Mr. Fred Krell, who was unbelievable. And, and, and I want to circle back to what uh, Anthony said earlier, that it's not just the musicianship. It's almost like saying in sports, it's not just how many baskets can you sing? Can you be a team player? Are mm -hmm. you appropriate? Are you respectful? And I loved hearing that from Anthony because uh, also in later years, Anthony will know this as a trumpet player. I walked into that band room and I heard some guy playing the trumpet on a, on a record and I fell in love and it was Maynard Ferguson. And it was probably 76 or 77. He was playing, he was playing the Gonna Fly Now theme from Rocky. Well, up right. until the time right. Maynard Ferguson died, I saw him in concert 41 times, three times when I lived in Florida. But here's the kicker. When I became a teacher, I got together with the band director and we had Maynard Ferguson two years in a row come to our school. Wow. And I want to tell you that the magic for me wasn't just the performance, is that he sat in with the band in the early afternoon and he talked to us about how to sit, how to respect the player next to you. So that's beyond a dream come true. So I think that it shaped me as a person because I still have some of those friends today. These are people I knew because of music. I'm not a professional musician, never was, but it put me on a different path and gave me a different appreciation for the arts in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm interested in knowing um, whether you um, have young people playing with you because you know what? I just interviewed a young musician and he was an amazing musician and he had such a great attitude. He said it's his passion. Is it your passion, Anthony? Uh, oh, the music. Uh, it, I, I think the word passion is more of an understatement. It, it, um, my wife always says that music is my mistress <laughs> and, 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 I can't argue with her in that sense because it is a passion with me. It, um, I uh, every day I, I listen to music every day, and and there's certain music that I listen to almost on a daily basis. It's almost like a vitamin that I have to take, or I have to read more about so and so, or or read how someone did something or achieved something. But it it became immediately it. At the age of 12, it's, I, I went home and told my parents and I had my, my cornet in my case and I said, this is what I want to do when I grow up. And they kind of gave me that look like, ooh, you know, most parents, of course, they, they don't think of music as, as a career unless 
they start learning more about the band director, which was my original intention to be a band director, to be a high school music teacher. Um, but I, I, I proved to them that, that that's what I wanted to do and, and my commitment to it and, and played in every ensemble in high school and junior high and college and play every style of music and it, everything. I, I mean, I, I listened to it from all angles. So passion, absolutely. I think that, that I always uh, tell anyone, whether they're a musician or they're in the music industry, passion is the core ingredient. Um, and if you don't have it, then you really don't belong there. You might have landed there because it was an opportunity or it was by chance, but just like in any other field, if, if you are in medicine or in any, for that matter, there is a, a great deal of passion that has to be there. You have to find your passion. I, I am a believer in that, that you do have to find and pursue your passion. And it's like the old saying says, right? The, you, you love what you do. You'll never work another day in your life. Right. And, and that's what happens to me. A clock runs out at the end of the day. And I said, oh, my God, where's the gun? And I still have so much more. But you got to rest and start all over again the following day. So, Anthony, when it comes to following your passion, there was there was the musician passion. Right. right. And there's the passion to become an entertainment management professional. Right. So how did the passion for musician morph into the uh, management end? Well, when I was in college, I, I was asked to join a, a group that was signed to a major label at the time. And I knew one of the guys that was in the band. And actually, it, it was something that I was, to me, it was a big deal. If you knew somebody and they were signed to a major label, it, it was like, wow, you know, it was like, maybe one day, if not, I'll, do, I'll, I'll become a teacher regardless. And then one of the fellows approached me, the music director, one day. And he says, you know, I've, I've been watching you play and all that. Would you like to audition for the band? And I kind of turned around. And I thought he was speaking to somebody else. I said, no, I'm talking to you. And I said, uh, yeah, sure. I, I answered right away without even thinking. And he says, okay, I'll bring you a couple of pieces of music. You, go, you learn it and then rehearse and then see what everyone else thinks. And I joined the group. And sure enough, I was part of the group for about four or five years. It was on the old RSO label, which was the label that, for example, released the... Uh, Grease soundtrack and Saturday Night Fever soundtrack and the whole Bee Gees catalog and all these other right. groups. And I started to grow a desire to learn more about the business by listening on to the managers and the producers. I was, I was sort of like the one that, that drifted away from the band at certain times and just kind of stood by the manager or by the producer and just listened to them speak in a whole yeah. almost different language and they and they look at me and, and smile sometimes or laugh. I remember at one point I said, "What do you want or what do you listen?" To? I was Nineteen or eighteen, I said, "No, I'm just listening. I want to learn what you guys are talking about." And they just kind of laugh. But they, I think, they admired the fact that I just kind of went myself there and stood by them, and mm -hmm. just started abs absorbing. And I became very intrigued how this other side of music, the music business, works. Mm -hmm. Now, certain mechanisms can actually make uh, someone popular. You mentioned Maynard Ferguson, right? The great trumpet player in the jazz coming back from the Stan Kenton days. Yep, yep. And, but th there was a mechanism behind it. At, at the time he was signed, I think, to Columbia Records mm -hmm. and uh, the whole team and marketing, how, how to position him to, yeah. to make him grandeur. And yeah. that really attracted me. That, you that, know, I'm interested in knowing, Anthony, today, um, the music that is played for young people, for the most part, happens to be rap and hip hop. Um, what do you think about that music? And is there a way for you to manage somebody who does that? Because it's so different than jazz. Jazz is improvisation and it's fabulous. People who play the music are amazing. But when you talk about rap and you talk about hip hop, it's really a very different genre. And I'm just interested in knowing what you think about it. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. You know, um, I always think of uh, something, and I believe it was Dizzy Gillespie that said it, there, there's no such thing as bad music, just bad musicians. And I, I try to follow that in the sense that I, I keep myself as open as possible to all forms of art and, and think of it as an art form if the intention of it is for that purpose. 
well, at the same time, I think that if at points it, it starts to alienate people or, or, or belittle, insult, or, or you, you know, you know where, where it just uses wrong, just terrible verbiage uh, directed at whether it's a, a, a women or children, you know, children, or then I have a problem with it because I, I believe that, you know, it, through freedom of speech, of course, there's many things that we can say without being so uh, attacking and at the end of the day, so vulgar too, uh, because there is a, a line, I guess, where we draw what what is vulgar and what can be a social uh, message. Uh, and, and over the years, we've seen that with, with comedians, where when they started using certain levels of foul language, when you know, sometimes it it, it can be have a, a funny tone to it, but for others, it, it may be just uh, very uh, vulgar, and. Uh, but it, it, I, I know that for my personal taste, it's not what I gravitate to. I, 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 I like music to have texture all around. I, it's, it's built on sounds and rhythms and, and since the early ages. And so it, all, the rhythms are there, but I, I feel that it has to have the, the texture that is the example of rap. It, 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 in my opinion, it lacks texture. For one, uh, it's very rhythmic, and and I've found some to be very interesting rhythmically, and even to a point melodically perhaps. But then it lacks other areas that just don't draw upon. Um, I am always going to be a feel that I can. I want to be associated to music that makes people feel good. That that that. That um, that makes them want to come back for more. That doesn't attack. That is more for a, a general audience. I, I know that we can satisfy satisfy everyone all the time, right? Uh, some right. people have their favorite artists and others don't. But I, I I I wouldn't want to feel that anyone is ever even offended by music. Uh, it's one thing to be feeling that you just don't like that style. But one thing is to feel that you've been offended or it's just uh, offensive, maybe not to you, but you feel it, it might offend your neighbor. And that's bad in itself as well, too. And so oh. I, 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 I do draw a line there. Uh, and it's, I, I want to say it's unfortunate uh, that we are so flooded, I guess, in, in the industry because it's not even when, you know, the, the, the comparisons are when, when rock and roll became popular. And, you know, the guys with the long hair and the electric guitars and pounding. But there was still a great balance of genres in, within the music industry that we could listen to and, and, or, or, that, or that was selling and that was happening at the time. But it, now it seems that the, it's, it's very dominating. It's, 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 it, and I fault... I, 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 and I, and I say this openly too, I don't know back on this. I blame a lot of the big entertainment companies because they have focused all their, their resources in that one genre because of a lot of the collapse that also we've seen in the mm -hmm. music industry in recent years as a result of all the changes in the digital platforms. We're, we're not selling anything physical anymore. They're, they're trying to grab on to any which way that they can sell music. Every day there is new headlines about uh, new artists selling this or, or just recently Universal Music sold 10% of their company. In the past, that would be unheard of. If they're selling it, it's, it's certainly because they're trying to, to uh, gain uh, revenue from, from different areas and Sony as well and so forth. And, and so they're just solely focused not on and, and what could be could have artistic value, but simply for the moment, what what is going to sell today? Mm -hmm. but back in the 70s, it, it, the artists would get signed and, and, and there was a longer vision. You know, where would they be 30 years from now or so forth? That's, that's why you, the fact is also, too, that the majority of the music that gets streamed still and in the, the majority of the music that gets sold within the Sony catalog, Universal, or Warner is, is indeed catalog, is the music from, let's say, Billy Joel 
or Crosby, Stills and Nash or the Beatles or stuff that is probably 80s and prior to that. It's called it, money, it, isn't it, it, Anthony? It, it, yes, absolutely. But 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 it's it's endured the test of time too. There there was even if it was pop music, if it was maybe shallow to some, but there was a a sense of musical integrity placed into the effort of creating it, so that it could endure 30, 40 years. They they still uh, uh, bands like Chicago, Earth, Wind, and Fire, they continue continue and they go on the road and, and they and they sell out arenas um so but interesting now a twist to your question though uh, what i find is an artist like michael buble for example which is a contemporary we can call him a contemporary harry connick jr sort of frank sinatra kind of he travels with a big band of 16 musicians and every city he goes to he hires a string section an all-female string section you look around and he sells out arenas all over the world and you look out the makeup of his audience and it's such a beautiful makeup of demographic from young, old, black, white, uh, all ages, grandma, the grandkids, uh, high school kids, the college kids. And he's most of the time either singing standards or, or new material that he writes that does have that sort of big band feel. Uh, and- Mark... I'm going to interrupt you for a second, yeah, Anthony, ahead, because I know that Mark is a musician um, himself, as he's discussed, and he's also a person who thinks a lot about music, thinks about it. Now, Mark, I want to know, there are tunes today where Lady Gaga plays with a lot of the older musicians and singers. Um, when you hear that, don't you feel that it's a fabulous, it's just wonderful because Lady Gaga is accepting the music of people like Frank Sinatra and, you know, the, you name it, playing together. These kind of two, a younger person with an older person, doesn't it make a difference in this world when you see the generations come together? Definitely, like, uh, you know, artists like Tony Bennett used to stop at 60 or 70. I think he sold many more records or at least had so many more concerts, bigger concerts from 70 to 92. And I think his daughter or some family member managed him and kind of made that switch. Tom Jones, the, Tom Jones is 80 years old. When yeah. you see Tom Jones on uh, the voice, I think it's the voice, the UK right. version or something like that. That's a wonderful thing because uh, it's funny because uh, Anthony mentioned Michael Bublé, who I was supposed to see last year during the pandemic. And I'm seeing him in Allentown, Pennsylvania in a number of months. But I love when I go. That's what I loved about the Maynard Ferguson concerts. You'd see the people there who probably were, you know, played with Maynard or went to the concerts when the same age, but bringing their sons and their nephews who were 15 and 16 and, and, and pushing and, and, and passing the baton of music appreciation. But I want to switch a little bit to the fact that, um, you know, we see these big names you mentioned. We go, we see the glitz, we see the glamour, we see the 16 peak or, uh, piece orchestra. But what are some of the struggles faced by some of these musicians and performers? They're even the biggest of the big. It's not It's not always easy. People see what, what they want to show us. But what are some of the behind the scenes struggles you could tell us about? Well, you know, it, it, I mean, the struggles are are just like running any uh, business. The, 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 you, th- you sort of think of it as the, the company, the corporation, if you will, uh, is the artist. And then ev- every day is, is running and keeping that, 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 that mechanism going. And it's it, it, as big as they are, and they may have a lot of resources and support to back it financially, to make sure that the music gets on the radio, that gets on the TV, and so forth, there's always that grand possibility that the audience at the end of the day may just not like it, uh, or a, a, a part, a, a component of that mechanism, you, it, requ- it requires a whole team. You have promoters, you have marketing team, you have publicists, uh, it, and nowadays you have the playlist uh, people. If, if one of those wheels is just a little loose in there, that thing, it, it could fail. It could just fall apart. If it's an established name, 
it, it won't fail. It won't fall on its face. There's, there's always, of course, the loyal fans that are pursuing it. But nonetheless, to recover whatever the investment was, there's a lot of uh, sleepless nights for everyone leading up to that day of the release of a recording, which is usually what pre is, uh, is followed by then a tour. Uh, but the, 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 the preparation of all that is uh, pressure from all sides. If there's a big label involved, it's how much they invested and how much are they going to recover within what amount of time. And then everyone within that entity, I'll give you an example. At, at Sony, we'd have a big artist and they plan their release for November. They usually try to release for the end, last end of the year. Uh, it's sort of strategically uh, put together for that time of year because financially it makes sense because they feel that consumers are going to also have a little bit more money in their pocket uh, it, at least back in the day when it was CD but even with streaming they might actually if they don't have a streaming service they might actually subscribe to it because their favorite artist just released a new album and so they have to get everyone leading and preparing to it and it's very stressful even for the people within a company like a Sony that you think because they have the resources, everyone can sit kind of cushy. And it's not, the, the bigger the, the, the animal, the, the greater the pressure, because you know there is a hard deadline. There is most of the time, if not ever, there's no room for mistakes on anything from the development of the artwork to how it gets released, to the planning of the promotion, how if you work in a label, the last thing you want is a manager calling you up and screaming on the other end of the phone, why isn't my artist number one on the playlist this week for the, in the pop? Or, or, they, or, the, or they put the pressure on the uh, label president as well, too. Yeah. So it, it's, it's very sacrificial. We've heard many times, you know, the, the career of an artist is very sacrificing. Definitely. When you, when you talk but, but, about but artists, it, Anthony, I'm sorry, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. Uh -huh. when you talk about artists, I'm wondering what you look for when someone approaches you. I, I come to you on the best thing you ever heard. Hey, Anthony, I heard so much about you. Represent me. What happens next? You know, uh, I, I, I see the great talent, but I, then I, I look beyond the talent. I've, worked, I've, I've been with people with artists who are very talented, but if they don't have that infrastructure that that the inner core structure or, or discipline that if we need to be uh, tomorrow at 7 a.m at four or whatever it may be an interview or to get on the road and they went to bed that night at five o'clock in the morning they need to be ready at seven and, and not like oh well i got in late i gotta sleep uh, eight hours it's just, no you're gonna be up at, at seven and, and that's just a, a very simple example it it they they really, they, there has to be uh, one intestinal fortitude to, to really uh, sustain how many times you're going to be told you're not going to make it. You know, we're almost be, at the, yeah. um, Anthony, we're almost at the end of the show, which Mark, I'm sure, is um, going to say something to you. But yeah. what I want to know is, is there a message that you would like to leave our audience with? Because there is, I, I see your passion and I understand all the struggles, but there's got to be a message that you have for young people, for older people, for everybody. I say, if, if it's indeed what you truly want to do, if that's what your, where your passion lies, you, you cannot stop. You cannot stop uh, resilience. It should be the, the one word in front of you every morning and if you felt like you fell the night before, then the next morning you get up and you start all over again and you continue. Uh, if, if you ever feel that you need to give up, then that it stops there. It's great, great advice. Yeah. Great advice. But I got I to gotta put you on the spot here. Okay. What do you like more, being a musician or an entertainment agent for musicians? <laughs> Oh man, that's a tough one. I know. I, I love. I, 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 I love playing the horn, and I love. Uh, but I also great. I do receive great satisfaction when I work hard, and I and I see someone else succeed, and even if it was just a little bit or a lot, I I don't want the spotlight. It, I'll let them take it, but it, it is very rewarding. I I, I must admit. Yeah, it's it's You're sort of my coaching job. You know, you're an inspiration. Um, 
there's no question, Anthony, when people, when I listen to you, I want to be able to sing, I want to be able to play a music, you know, music, but I can't. So I really think that you're an inspiration to all generations. And I think it was really great listening to what you had to say. Oh, thank you very Definitely. much. And on that note, what is next for Anthony Gonzalez? Be your own agent. What's next for you? Well, um, I do have a startup label that I that I uh, started right before COVID. So I kind of had to put the brakes on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is there and I have it affiliated to a, a major digital distributor that is actually owned by Sony Music. So hopefully in 2021, uh, I, I, I will start releasing uh, content um, and uh, not necessarily re uh, focusing on jazz, but I, I, I want to feature people who play or people who sing, <laughs> uh, very hands-on playing and, 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 and looking out for that next new great person that, that can, you know, can, can really convey great talent. Well, Anthony, I want to thank you. Anthony Gonzalez, thank you for joining us thank today. You, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Susan. Both. So yes. much. It's the secret of the music business, the passion. Susan, thanks again, Susan uh, Brenda, for being my co-host today. Uh, this is Mark Holman. Thank you for watching Light in the Educational Flame. Have a great day. Anthony, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame. To contact Mark Hoberman, email him at info at gradesuccess.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame.